looks as if we have a fair number of participants. So thank you very much for joining. The title of my talk is going to be Introduction to Evidence-Based Medicine in the Era of COVID-19. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking the organizers for putting this on. I think this has been a phenomenal initiative, and I'm certainly honored to be one of the speakers. So let me... Sorry, some technical issues. So I wanted to start off by affirming that I have no financial conflicts of interest related to this talk. I do wanted to point out that I have some potentially perceived intellectual conflict of interest. I'm gonna um, mention a few organizations and entities so that I'm involved with. For example, I'm the editor of Cock and Urology that I will mention. I'm a longstanding member of the Grade Working Group and I was also a contributor to the AUA core curriculum chapter on evidence-based medicine. Also wanted to welcome and thank uh, the moderator for this session. It's uh, Dr. Maria Uloko. She's currently a urology chief resident at my institution, um, the University of Minnesota. I, I guess I should have said something about myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm a urologist uh, faculty at the University of Minnesota. I do all my clinical care at the Minneapolis VA, and I have a long-standing interest in promoting the principles of evidence-based medicine and critical appraisal skills. So, uh, but, but thank you, Maria, for doing this. And one of the things that Maria will help with is collating your questions for the question and answer session at the end. Okay, so I wanted to make this as interactive as possible. Um, I hope, there won't be any technical problems. That's always the most challenging. Uh, I've put together a few polling questions. In order to respond, you would need to go to this um, site, Paul EV, stands for pauleverywhere.com forward slash EBM. And the first question I wanted to put to the audience is, how often do you have journal club? So I am hoping that this will work. If it doesn't, we will scratch these interactive questions. Okay, good. Okay, we're getting some responses. Looks as if uh, two thirds of you have monthly journal club, approximately one third has quarterly, as a quarterly journal club. Looks as if everybody has journal club of those of you that are here. Excellent, okay. And another question, aside from journal club, do you have any learning activities that are specifically focused on teaching you EBM related skills, critical appraisal skills, maybe how to search the literature, how to interpret the literature? Okay. Okay. So it looks as if at the moment, three quarter view, not really, one quarter, yes. Okay. So maybe. This is a good reason to have this to have this lecture increased here. Okay, um, and when you prepare a presentation, such as grand rounds, M and M, or case presentation, what resources what resources do you like to search for? Ideally, for reliable evidence. Okay, PubMed. RCTs, articles. Okay, PubMed is the guidelines. Okay, guidelines. The AUA will be glad to hear. Review. Okay, good. So let me um, end here. Finally, I've listed a few resources that are going to come up in my talk. And I wanted to ask you 
to rank them by the likelihood that you will use them. I recognize that some of them you may have never heard about, um, but I think some of them will be very familiar to you. Okay. Okay, so this is this is good. PubMed number one, guidelines number two, Cochrane Library number three, split for a spot with Google and Google Scholar, up to date in Dynamed and Trip Database comes in last, which was not unexpected. Okay, good. Um, so disclaimer for this talk, uh, there will be disappointingly very little urology in this talk. And number two, uh, while I will use COVID-19 as a, as a backdrop for this talk, I'm, I'm really not an infectiologist. I'm not an infectious disease doc. I'm not a COVID expert. Um, so so why, why am I doing this? What is the premise of this talk? I, I think we, we live in an era of major uncertainty and we all share a strong desire for reliable information about a condition that we knew about very little about un until very recently. And, and that is really one of the strongest motivating factors towards learning critical appraisal skill and towards evidence-based medicine to find reliable information. So, so I've built this around the question, COVID-19, where is the evidence? Um, so just as a backdrop, when we talk about EBM, what do we actually mean? So there are two guiding principles of EBM, and they are one, using the current best evidence to inform decisions about patient care and health policy. This is the most well-known principle of EBM. And the second, which is less well-known, oftentimes forgotten, has always been part of, sorry about this, is that is to integrate the best evidence with the individual patient's specific circumstances, values, and preferences. And the origins of EBM, we associate that with somebody named David Sackett. So David Sackett was an American who, uh, who, who left and went to Canada. He founded the Department for Clinical Epidemiology at McMaster University. And he also then went on and did similar things in the UK. He formed the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University. And he's also uh, known for this quote that I'll read to you, half of what you learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell you which half. So the most important thing to learn is, apologize for the glitches here. Um, the most important thing is to, is to learn how to learn on your own. So EBM is closely related to continued, continued medical education. Now, when we talk about EBM, apologize, another issue that is important is to distinguish between different types of questions. And we talk about background questions and foreground questions. And background questions are typically questions that begin with what, why, and how. And foreground questions are more specific questions, and I'll give you an example. The less you know about a condition, when you're an intern, for example, or just learning about urology, um, you know, you will be mostly interested in background questions. But longer, the longer you're involved, you're in a clinical area, the more your questions switch towards foreground questions. This is also the you know, I think, you know, most uh, residents, especially junior residents, will enjoy Journal Club regardless of what articles we discuss because they learn a tremendous amount of background knowledge. Uh, but, you know, that enthusiasm goes away if you've, you've read the same things for 10, 15, 15 years and you really want to advance your knowledge with regards to foreground questions. So some examples of background questions are, for example, what is the coronavirus? Why are older patients uh, more susceptible than younger patients? How long is the incubation period? And what is the case fatality rate? So these are all very important questions, but they're not the focus of, of evidence-based medicine. On the other hand, to give you some examples of actual foreground questions, 
those are questions that you can frame in a PICO format. For example, in clinical encounters with COVID pathogen patients, how do surgical masks compare to N95 masks? So that's an example of a study of prevention, of a question of prevention. In patients with severe COVID infection, how does remdesivir compare to supportive care only? That would be a question related to, to therapy. Um, to other questions, what are the outcomes of COVID positive patients undergoing major urological surgery? Question of prognosis, or what is the diagnostic accuracy of the ABOT ID now point of care test? Uh, looking at sensitivity and specificity, that is a question of diagnosis. So these are the type of questions that are the focus of evidence-based medicine. Now, how do you find the best evidence? When I look at this slide, I, I, I think of um, the, the gentleman on the left-hand side reminds me of Hugh Hampton Young, one of the founding fathers of, 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 of urology. He was also the editor, the founding editor, I believe, of the Journal of Urology. I bet he read every single article. He commanded the entire urological knowledge of his time. Needless to say, as illustrated here, those times are long gone. And unless you have certain strategies for helping you, um, you know, search for evidence, critically appraise the evidence, you, uh, you know, you will not succeed. So challenges that we face is, you know, what studies or study or studies should I use? Can I believe the results? Are the results clinically meaningful? And are they applicable to my patient or my patients? So when you look for evidence, you can put the evidence that you find into two big buckets. One are primary studies. Examples are randomized trials, cohort studies, case series, etc. And then the second buckets are uh, resources or studies that include some element of pre-appraisal. This is filtered evidence and they fall into the categories of synopsis, synthesis, summaries, and systems. And we don't have to get hung up about these details, but I think it's important to recognize that there is a, is a hierarchy of these resources um, and that you know, there's this hierarchy by Brian Haynes uh, that distinguishes between these five levels and this, these primary studies at the very bottom. The problem with these primary studies is that you have no idea whether they, you know, they are valid, whether you can believe them, whether the results are meaningful, and whether they're really applicable. And the higher you go on this pyramid, the more likely you're going to find valid and helpful information at the point of care. So ideally, you would, you know, you would, you would go to those sources first, especially if you don't have a lot of time if you're in a busy clinic. So you probably know at least one of these two resources. Your institution probably has a subscription. So what does Dynamed and UpToDate do? They, they, they do systematic literature searches. They critically appraise and synthesize the evidence. Now, one downside is that these are primarily developed, I believe, for internists and primary care physicians, and they oftentimes don't. They lack the granularity that we would look for as a urologist. But nevertheless, they they can be quite helpful. Um, we have a number of residents or partners of residents that are expecting, very worried about the impact of uh, COVID infection. So um, that was that prompted me to look in Dynamed. Um, it, it pulls together, you know, a vast amount of information and, and appraises it. So I think this could be very helpful it's very helpful to have this kind of an information resource. Um, so the, the next category of, of resources that I want to talk about are guidelines, right? Most important to us are the guidelines of the AUA and also the EAU. Um, how do I search for guidelines? Well, maybe, uh, you know, there are m many of the topics uh, to urology are actually covered. Um, by those two organizations, but there are topics, for example, on VTE prophylaxis, where there may not be um, guidelines specifically by these organizations, so you need to look beyond. Until recently, the National Guideline Clearinghouse was a really great resource to have. It was supported by ARC. Unfortunately, it was recently defunded, 
and I'm not sure it's coming back anytime soon. So if you look for, if you're looking for other high quality guidelines, another place to look is, 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 is GIN, Guidelines International. Um, this is what their website looks like. They have also put a tremendous amount of effort into resources related to COVID. And if you look across the slide, you'll see there it has a very international flair, you know, Norwegian Institute of Public Health and so on. A lot of French National Authority of Health, so a lot of international resources are included here too. So the next category of um, resources are systematic reviews. What are systematic reviews? Systematic reviews try to pull together the entire body of evidence for a given question systematically and transparently. Uh, they are also foundational to evidence-based guidelines. So every evidence-based guidelines also has a systematic review underpinning it. And you know this is where a lot of the cost and guideline developments go to is, is, is uh, generating these systematic reviews. Uh, we associate systematic reviews with Sir Archie Cochrane, who is the founding father of the Cochrane collaboration. And in the middle here, I'm showing you their logo, which is an idealized uh, forest plot that you might recognize. I'm sure you all are very familiar with systematic reviews because large numbers of systematic reviews get published in the urology literature every year. In fact, there has been an exponential increase and the number of systematic reviews that have been published. This is a study that uh, a former resident from the University of Florida, where I used to be, um, did. And you know, not only shows you the increase, but also shows you that all four major journals are in on this, but that a large number is actually being published in European urology. So, um, I think there's a lot of similarity between what I'm showing you here and the quality of systematic reviews, right? So if there's been this increase in the number of systematic reviews, wouldn't it be nice to show that the quality of these systematic reviews is high or at least increasing. So I wanted to, I hope this is still working. The next question I wanted to ask you is, what do you think am I showing you here? Uh, regardless where I give, uh, talks like this, when I show this picture, typically people recognize this as something that they might eat. So I'll give it a, a minute here. Okay, print is rather small, but we have a small gumbo on the left. Okay, so gumbo is all we get. So I think gumbo is a great guess. So this is actually a, uh, this, this picture was taken in Marseille. This is a so-called bouillabaisse, a famous French fish soup. And the parallel that I see with systematic reviews is that I would suppose before you get in line for your share of this delicious soup is that you wanna convince yourself of two things. Number one, that the chef has washed his hands and knows what he's doing. And number two, that he's only using the freshest ingredients. And right, and there's the, the parallel to systematic reviews is that it really depends on what goes into these systematic reviews. If the evidence is poor, the systematic review is not gonna fix that. And, but you also need to know what you're doing. There are well-established methods of how to do these systematic reviews that you have to abide by. Um, you know, from the same study um, by Julia Hahn, we looked at the quality of these systematic reviews. We used a validated instrument called AMSTAR, and we, this is actually three, the, the three time intervals that we compared. So we were, what was plotted here is the median quality over the years across journal. And what you see here is that really over time, there has been very little that might, maybe first of all, that the quality is rather modest, right? The, the score on a scale of, of zero to 11 is, is average is around five. 
So that's one finding. And the second finding is that there's really been no improvement over time, despite the vast number of systematic reviews that have been published. So I think that's, that's important to know that these are all not necessarily particularly well done, right? And that is actually in contrast to reporting of randomized controlled trials in urology, that has actually been shown to have improved. So one resource for reliable systematic reviews is the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, it's an international non-for-profit organization. It, it's recognized for having pioneered the methods used for creating high quality reviews. Those include a published protocol, several rounds of peer review, and aggressive conflict of interest management. Maybe interesting to learn that these are mostly volunteer authors and also editors doing most of the work. And, you know, Cochrane has become a, an important resource for reliable evidence in the corona pandemic. Um, these are some examples of Cochrane reviews that are at least peripherally relevant to what we do um, here, quarantine alone or in combination with other public health measures, physical interventions to interrupt, reduce spread. Maybe the last one here, regional anesthesia to reduce drug use and avoid aerosol generation. Um, you know, I, uh, we tend to have more explicit discussions with our colleagues from anesthesia nowadays uh, to see whether they really need a, uh, um, uh, whether they need to be intubated or whether their surgery can, done, can be done with a MAC. And, and this, is, this is the basis of those, those deliberations. Um, I wanted to put in a plug for Cochlear Neurology, which is the editorial group that is responsible for many of the urology related reviews. Uh, it's based at the Minneapolis VA and the University of Minnesota. Recently, we've also added a satellite in Wonju, South Korea. It was uh, founded by Tim Wilt over 25 years ago. He might be familiar to some of you as the principal investigator of the PIVOT trial. Our scope includes all the urological cancers, BPH, stone disease, and men's health. It, however, does not include, um, you know, conditions related to incontinence that is managed by a separate group, the incontinence group in Aberdeen. Um, our managing editor is Rob Lane. Rob Lane is actually the husband of a former resident here at the University of Minnesota, Julia Lane, who's currently doing a uh, fellowship at the University of Michigan. So if you contact him and uh, explain to him your situation as a resident that's really busy, but nevertheless wants to get involved, I'm sure he will understand where you're coming from. Um, this is uh, the TRIP database that I didn't expect many of you to know about, but it's, uh, it's, it, 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 it's quite useful. It's, it's a free resource. It self-describes itself as a clinical search engine designed to allow users to quickly find and use high quality evidence. It's actually a meta search engine that looks across other resources, very easy to use. And one of the features that I like is that it provides you this inventory of, of what resources it has searched on this given, given topic. So for example, it will provide a link to guidelines here grouped by continent and country. So this is, this is helpful. Now, if you take nothing else away from this uh, talk, I would encourage you to check out this resource, which is called Evidence Alert. It is a, it's a collaboration between McMaster University and Dynamed. What they do is they systematically search, uh, they systematically screen 110 journals. They have a preset, um, preset criteria with which they critically appraise these studies, and then they actually send them out to clinicians like you and me and ask them to rate them based on clinical relevance and newsworthiness. So it's, it's actually free, right? And it provides a push service. So it, when, every, when something new of interest to your area has been published, they will send you an email. And, but you can also actually subscribe. You can actually also enroll as a, as a reviewer and been one of the people that, um, that determines whether the, how relevant and how newsworthy this is. Uh, so push service, I told you already, um, you know, maybe less relevant um, as long as you're a resident, but once you're in private practice or community practice or whatever practice you are and want to keep abreast with things or they're moving the field of urologists, this can be really helpful. Um, so this is um, 
this is an example of my um, my alert list uh, over the last month. Um, and just to show you an example, one of the things that I was alerted to is this, this so-called POUT trial published in the Lancet, adjuvant chemotherapy and upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, you know, you might learn about this on Twitter um, or some other way, but this would be a reliable way for you to learn about um, high impact, important publications. Um, so, however, you know, many times you don't have any pre-appraised evidence and you have to appraise these studies by yourself. So how do you do that? The most widely used framework is that of the JAMA's user's guide. Uh, this actually started as a series of individual articles that were initially published in, draw, in, in JAMA and then drawn together as a book. So one downside to this book, however, is that the examples mainly focus on internal medicine and that was really the motivation to, to publish the user's guide to the urological literature. That's a, a series of eight articles that has been published in JU. And also this is also the, um, the basis of the AUA core curriculum. So the, the main contribution that those of us that were involved with the AUA core curriculum for EBM is to translate the user's guide into urology related examples. Now, when you, when people talk about the quality of evidence, the most commonly cited framework for rating the certainty of evidence is are the levels of evidence. And this relates back to the center of evidence-based medicine in, in Oxford. And you, you will be familiar with this system, but there are five levels. Level one are randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews. And at the bottom is what, 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 what is called expert opinion. And the further you go down on this hierarchy, the more bias there is. Now this is, a, you know, this, this framework is, is largely valid, but it places a very high focus on, um, on, 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 on study design and, and also, you know, so randomized control trials and systematic reviews being at the, at the very top. And I think as a result, there are two misconceptions that I come across a lot which are one that RCT evidence equates high certainty evidence. And number two, RCT evidence means that you have to do certain, a certain thing, right? So you will, you will, prominent speakers will give plenary sessions at the AUA and they will say, now there is level one evidence for that reason, we need to do the following, right? But both of those concepts are, are really somewhat misguided, just because you now have at least one RCT doesn't mean you have evidence of high certainty, and it certainly doesn't mean that you should do something, but you still have to weigh the benefit, harms, and ideally cost of an intervention. So another framework for rating the quality of evidence is that of grade. Um, I don't have time to talk about it too much, but but um, but look, take a look at this, this this figure here, what you will notice is that the, um, the, the, the borders between the different study designs is, is wavy. So what this is meant to signal is that sometimes randomized controlled trials provide much lesser evidence. And in fact, observational studies provide higher quality evidence than can be found in randomized controlled trials. And the second thing that is different is you'll see that the, 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 the top of the pyramid is chopped off and is now the, the handle of this, uh, of this loop, right? So, so the systematic reviews, we can do systematic review of any study design, systematic reviews that use grade to rate the certainty of evidence is really the tool that you use to look at other bodies of evidence. And how does this all come together in grade? Well, one of the things, one of the other things that is unique about grade is that not only do a randomized controlled trial start up as high quality evidence, but then drop down because of issues that relate to bias and imprecision and publication bias and so on. But also observational studies may actually get rated up uh, if certain criteria are met. So it puts randomized controlled trials and observational studies on the same playing field. I've previously mentioned to you the user's guide, the medical literature, and the three questions that it asks you to, to, to put to every study. One is, are the results valid? So did the study measure what it intended to? And can I, 
can I actually believe the results? Number two, what are the results? And you know that seems like a trivial thing, but when you do so, look not only at the relative effect sizes, but also the absolute effect sizes, and look at look at the confidence intervals. And thirdly, are the results applicable to my patients? And and really, you have to give an affirmative answer to all of these three questions for this study to be useful, right? If it's not valid, doesn't really mean if the results are great, if the results are not clinically meaningful, it doesn't really matter whether they're applicable and whether they're valid. So all of those, um, all of those questions need to be addressed affirmatively, at least to some degree, for this information to be useful for you. So as I said, I, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of interest in sorting through evidence and distinguishing between fake news and, and real news. Um, one of the things that recently gave us hope was the, that the FDA authorized, gave emergency authorization for remdesivir to treat coronavirus. Uh, this actually came out on May the 1st. And at the time, um, there's this, uh, this, is this news article. And, and one of the things that is conspicuously absent is any reference to a randomized controlled trial. Now, you know, is that always essential? I think one of the things that is emphasized in the EBM framework is that you use the current best evidence. And we have many, you know, scenarios in urology where we have no RCTs and that might be okay. So we can't always wait until we have RCT evidence we recognize that evidence is, is, is rapidly evolving. And I think we also have to acknowledge that once we have better evidence, we might be making better decisions. But either way, it's really important to take a close look at the evidence and look underneath the surface because oftentimes what you find underneath the surface can be quite ugly. So at the time of FDA approval, the best current evidence was probably this study, which was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it resulted in quite a, a uproar in the social media. And I particularly like these posts by, by this individual, Paul Young from New Zealand. I'll just write, read you the first line here. Really troubling that at New, New England Journal of Medicine have published a case series like this. It provides zero basis for drawing causal inferences about the effects of remdesivir and outcomes. It has been only published because it's clickbait, right? And it goes, goes on like this. And then I also found this article, uh, this online article and a blog, which reads 11 reasons why the New England Journal of Medicine paper on remdesivir reveals nothing. So quite outspoken. So I thought this could be a good backdrop to talk about why critical appraisal is important and some of the things that you should think about. So maybe to give you a little bit background on this study, what was this study? So it was actually a retrospective case series. It looked at treatment with remdesivir on a compassionate basis. So on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, clinicians were able to treat their patients with remdesivir. And they enrolled patients that had an oxygen saturation of 94% or less on room air. And these patients, they enrolled 61 patients and they were treated for 19 days. But the results of the study were only reported if you had at least one additional day of outcomes. So you really needed to be on the study for 19 plus one days, which is 20 days. So why were there potential problems with this study? So I'm going to go through these, at least quickly go over these 11 points because I think they're quite well made. So one of the things, so, so one of the glaring things is that there was no control group. And when you think about whether you care about that or not, it's really important to understand the question that you're trying to see addressed. So there is the question that you could ask, which is in patients with severe COVID infection, what are the outcomes of taking remdesivir and supportive care, right? What are the outcomes? Um, that is a question of prognosis, and that is perfectly well addressed with a single arm study. 
Now, ideally, this would be a prospective study, and ideally, you would like to read that these were consecutive patients, but a certainly a single-arm study would be, would be okay. Now, however, in this case, and in many cases, we're really much more interested in uh, the question of therapy, which compares how they would do with remdesivir and supportive care versus supportive care alone, right? So we would really want to see a placebo-controlled trial with a comparator arm. Now, do we always need RCTs? No, we don't, right? And what illustrates this point uh, um, in a nice way is this the study that is cited. It was a BMJ Christmas edition. It, it's cited heavily both by proponents of evidence-based medicine as well as its antagonists. Um, what this article talks about is that there are many things um, that we believe are highly effective that have never been proven with a randomized control trial, right? And jumping out of an airplane with a parachute is, is one such example, no? And that is, that is entirely true. So when, when does this, when is this relevant? Well, what, what does this mean in, in medical speak? Why well, this is, this is relevant in the setting of interventions that are extremely effective, right? Now, unfortunately, that doesn't happen too often. Now, modeling has suggested that this that RCTs might not be necessary if the risk ratio is greater than 10 or less than 0 0.1, right? So these are highly effective interventions. Then it is very unlikely that residual confounding will account for that treatment effect. Examples in urology, so for example, cisplatin-based chemotherapy in metastatic testicular cancer was approved on the basis of historical controls, right? So everybody, pretty much everybody used to die, um, they gave them cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and a substantial proportion of those patients live. And, you know, another example that I've thought about where we also don't have RCT evidence is, um, you know, now rarely, but, but once in a while you have a patient with metastatic, with symptomatic metastatic prostate cancer who's hormone naive, who's never been treated, you know, who might have neurological symptoms, who has pain, you androgen ablate him, say by, you know, you give him a shot of Degorelix, you give him ketoconazole, or you take him to surgery and do a surgical or a, 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 a bilateral orchiectomy, right? These patients, it's amazing how quickly these patients improve, right? So another example of an intervention where you would, it wouldn't occur to you to randomize patients because something, it, it, it's very apparent that something works Unfortunately, we, we, we don't have those interventions so often, and this is certainly not the case here, not this example. So um, turning back to the study, so the second issue is, the, is, 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 you know, given that there's no control group, you know, we would really like to know how these patients were selected and whether they were representative. So the study only enrolled 61 patients, and they don't really tell us anything about how these patients were selected and how they were screened and whether they, you know, did they screen 100 patients or did they screen 1,000 patients to get to the 61, right? And one concern is maybe they specifically picked patients that were likely to recover anyway, right? And that would obviously make the results of this uncontrolled study look a lot better. Well, third point, loss of patients. So, I told you the study enrolled 61 patients. However, at the bottom, you'll see that they only include 53 published, uh, 53 patients in their analysis. So there were a lot of patients. Um, I think my math here is wrong. Um, they they did looks as if they did analyze analyze these patients. So it's not as bad as I have it here. I just picked up on this that they did include some of these patients. Anyway. Um, you know, very few studies, and even if it's just eight patients that were taken out, this is a relatively large proportion of greater than 10% of patients. Um, the problem is that these patients, that these patients dropped out was probably not a random event. Maybe they dropped out because they were not doing well or because they had side effects from the medication. So that is a potential, another potential problem. Sample size estimates and stopping rules. So you know that 
you know, most studies should have a, you know, some sample size calculation. Um, interim analyses are good, but they're primarily um, related to safety. So you would like to stop a study if there are safety concerns, but it, you really should not stop a study early um, for any other reasons. Now here, there is really no sample size calculation given, and it really was unclear why the study was reported out at 61 patients, right? So one evil thought we have is maybe after 61 patients, the results looked rather good, and so the investigator decided this is a good time to report, right? But we don't know what would happen if they would have enrolled another 39, bringing them to 100, they would have enrolled 100 patients or 200 patients, so on. So lack, this is closely related, they had no primary endpoint, right? You will be familiar, most studies do have a primary endpoint. It's what we use for the sample size calculation. Uh, the problem is if you don't have a pre-identified endpoint, there is concern that, you know, of all the many things that you might be collecting, you might be selectively reporting the things that argue in your favor, right? So that is the, the next issue. Inclusion criteria, um, and as I showed you, they included a lot of patients that were doing reasonably well, right? Saturating at 94% of the low, um, 19 patients of these, of these 61 were not intubated. Um, so once again, you know, inclusion of studies of, of patients is really important for the outcome. So if they included patients that were minimally sick, um, more patients will have done better and the outcomes might be more favorable. Delayed administration, this is the, you know, the thing that they talk about that I know the least about, but they noticed that it took them on, the, the, the onset of treatment was after median of 12 days. And they thought this was strange because typically patients declare themselves um, either before, uh, typically before these 12 days, right? So if they're gonna do poorly, they, they do that before day 12 and, and by day 12, they typically do better. So, um, so once again, you know, the suspicion that maybe by treating them relatively late, you would have selected for a group of people that were going to do well anyway. Outcomes, um, and they say, you know, are the outcomes really that good? If you focus on those patients that were critically ill, actually 44% of them died nevertheless, right? So that is not too impressive. Once again, homing on those patients that were critically ill. So I've got two more points here. You know, they do report transparently and comprehensively on serious adverse events, but the problem is if you don't have a comparison group, it's hard to put these um, adverse events into perspective. So are they related to the drug or are they related to the infection? Right? It's really obscured without a control group once again, getting back to the issue of a control group. And lastly, you know, who conducted the study, who, uh, and, and who wrote the paper? In this case, there was, I think it's fair to say that there was total control by the sponsor. So when you read a study, always look at, you know, who, whose idea was it, who conducted the study, who wrote the protocol, how was the analysis done, um, you'll find big differences. So in this case, it was all the sponsor, which is Gilead Sciences, right? They developed the program, they did the study, they performed the statistical analysis, and also a writer employed by them was, you know, drafted the study. You know? So you can bet there is not a comma out of place on that article because that writer would have gotten fired, right? So everything will have been depicted in the most favorable light in the interest of the sponsor. You can bet on that, I think. So what are the take home messages? So I think I hope to have convinced you that this study had some serious issues and based on the study alone, would be very uncertain whether the outcomes are really improved. You know, this was published in a highly prestigious journal. Unfortunately, that alone provides very little assurance of of the results being trustworthy. And I hope this makes the point 
that you really need to have a framework for critically appraising studies on your own. You can't just rely on, you know, on the journal of publication. So luckily on this, you know, on, on this question of whether remdesivir helps or not, there has been uh, subsequently another study, um, very different study, also published in the same journal though. This was a randomized controlled study that had a placebo control. It was conducted with international participation. It was funded among other things by the NIH. It randomized 1,063 hospitalized patients and it had meaningful endpoints like as time to recovery and mortality outcomes that included mortality and serious adverse events. So just to run you through, you know, a critical appraisal of this study, this one actually checks all the boxes. So did they tell us how the patients were randomized? Yes. Did they tell us that allocation was concealed? Yes, they did. Were the patients and the personnel blinded? Yes, they were. Were outcome assessors blinded, right? Outcome assessors can nearly always been blinded. So in this case, they were. And was there minimal loss to follow up? Yes, there was less than 5%. And did they analyze the study by intention to treat, which is the preferred approach for superiority study? And once again, affirmative. So, right, these studies, these study results are pretty reliable. Now, getting to the results, this is an example of a grade summary of findings table. It's kind of a, an overview of the results of a typically of a systematic review, but since there's really not much other relevant evidence here on, on this particular question, it's, it's the results of this one study. You'll see the, there are three uh, lines um, that represent the three outcomes. The, the certainty of evidence is rated independently for them because it can differ. And you'll see here the relative effect size estimates together with the confidence interval. But then importantly here, you will see the absolute effect size estimate. And sometimes it's quite enlightening to look at that because oftentimes relative effect size, effect size estimates look quite impressive, but when you translate that into absolute numbers or a number needed to treat, it, it's not that exciting anymore. So in terms of recovery, I think we have meaningful um, outcomes. 168 more patients per thousand will recover if you treat them with remdesivir rather than just supportive care, right? Meanwhile, for mortality at 14 days, much less impressive, right? So 34 fewer per thousand and a confidence interval that ranges from 61 fewer to four more, right? So four more actually means the opposite that patients might potentially be harmed. And you saw already on the relative confidence, relative effect size that the that it crosses the, the, the one, the, the line of no effect. So this, this outcome was also not statistically significant. So once again, you know, look at the confidence interval and try to translate the results into absolute effect size estimate. And lastly, right, are the results applicable? In this case, yes, um, probably, right? Um, you know, how do you make that decision? Um, you look at the inclusion criteria and, um, and you know, if, if your patient doesn't, autom you know, totally fit that, you should ask the question, is there a compelling reason why the evidence should not apply to the patient? Uh, two other questions are, were all patient important outcomes considered? And lastly, the ultimate question is, are the likely benefits, are they worth the harms and potential costs? Now, I don't, don't actually know what remdesivir costs and how it will get priced, but we'll certainly soon know. So that is the end of my talk. I have this one last slide. I hope, uh, you know, so why should you care about evidence-based medicine and critical appraisal? I hope to have shown you that this is, that this is something foundational, um, as foundational as, as using a stethoscope. Now, I, I think I gotta take that slide out because I haven't used a stethoscope for quite some time, but maybe as foundational as holding and using a scalpel, which is still a relevant um, skill for a urologist or as foundational as, as being able to put in a, a, a trocar port and to uh, uh, dock, dock a robot. So, um, so thank you very much for joining me for this. If you have any questions later on, this is my email address. This is my Twitter handle. 
and the organizers have asked me to show this as the last slide um, that provides you an opportunity to provide feedback and uh, let us know what you liked and what you didn't like. So once again, thank you very much for attending. Um, I would now um, see whether there are any questions and ask Dr. Yuloko to, to help um, um, triage those questions so that we can, for the question and answer session. All right, so one question that we have um, is how do you go about appraising evidence as medicine changes? For instance, Messing has a uh, randomized control study showing the benefit of ADT after prostatectomy for prostate cancer in node positive patients. It is criticized as being done prior to the PSA era. Now people reference non-RTC evidence that ADT is not necessary for node positive patients. Can you comment on this phenomenon? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I agree that this study was done a long time ago. And uh, so, so one of the ways that we, we deal with that kind of information, um, maybe, maybe a similar example is, um, is, is relates to uh, you know, surgical procedures that we used to do very differently 20 years ago and now, right? Is, is by referring to that as, as, as indirect evidence. So in, uh, in um, so let me, let me just, um, unshare here i'm being what are you guys looking at are you guys looking at my slides or are you looking at me we're looking at you okay good um okay so um so i i, I think I, I i agree that this study was done a long time ago the messing study and it might not be directly applicable to our patients um you know, but, but that trial and similar trials that were done may still provide the current best evidence. Uh, we would rate it down for, for a phenomenon called indirectness. Um, uh, but but um, I would worry that any observational studies that you have on this context, um, you know, might, might even be, be, be less, less valid, less, less, uh, less trustworthy, right? So um, observational studies also come in different shades of, in different flavors, so to speak, right? And there are, in, in, in other settings, there are um, observational studies that are probably more trustworthy than randomized controlled trials. For example, I think in the, on the topic of uh, um, radi radical versus partial nephrectomy, the, some of the observational studies that used uh, uh, instrumental variable analysis they, they provide very good evidence that's probably better than the one RCT that we have. So that was a very long-winded answer. Okay. So next question um, is, do you have any recommended critical appraisal training on any websites or any forums? Yeah. So thank you for that question. So um, at the moment, um, the, the only thing I can point you to is uh, some of these published um, resources. So what's in the AUA core curriculum for evidence-based medicine. Um, there's the user's guide to the urological literature that was published years ago in JU. There are some short articles published in BJU International um, and they were called uh, putting evidence into practice, I think, or something along those lines. Um, it might be a little bit premature, but you know, there's some, um, we're looking at a um, collaboration between Cochrane Urology and the SIU of creating some specific online modules for residents. So apparently the SIU has done a survey of its residents members. And, and one of the areas of great interest was how to learn more about how to critically appraise research. So in response to that, um, you know, we're talking about creating some online modules and that would maybe, maybe be something that you're the, the person who asked this question might be interested in. Um, moving on to the next question, how many papers should be considered minimum in a systematic review? And can you include papers with different study designs in a systematic review? Very good question. So, um, you know, you, um, 
you will find some Cochrane reviews that, that are empty reviews, right? Where they did a comprehensive search and they found nothing and they still published it. Um, so that is, um, that is the least helpful. Um, we have a, in our portfolio, we have a few uh, systematic reviews where you have a, a single study included. And, and so the, the main purpose of that systematic review is to essentially provide a summary of findings table and to critically appraise and put that evidence into perspective. I, I do think as a rule of thumb, a systematic review and meta-analysis becomes more interesting the more studies you have, and especially if they are, if if if, if they have controversial results. So, for example, uh, tremendously interesting topic is uh, medical expulsive therapy uh, for patients that present with ureteral colic. Right. So there are at least 65 randomized controlled studies, and there continues to be a heated debate on, you know, does it help? Does it help at all? Uh, you know, is it worth the cost? So, so this is this is a setting where you can really uh, work with um, with uh, in a in a systematic view. The, the second question was, do you can you combine different bodies of evidence? Uh, yes, you can. It's it's actually it's a good thing to look beyond RCTs alone. One of the things that I would caution you about is to to to, to pooling them, right? So we, you know, the the basis of this. Of, of any certainty of evidence rating is, is that there's, we think there are big differences between an RCT and an observational study, right? That's why RCTs are so valuable because you create groups that are comparable and then you treat both groups the same way and you don't have that in observational studies. So you can include two bodies of evidence, but you know, as certainly as a first step, you should show them side by side and not just, you know, pull them and stir the pot. Next question, um, how long do you think we will, will have to wait before more valid COVID-19 trials come out? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Do I, uh, I guess that depends on the, on, the, uh, on the specific question, right? I think it will take a long time for us to get any answers as it relates to vaccines. I do think that the, that the whole research enterprise, especially where there are commercial interests, where there are pharmaceutical companies involved, are on overdrive, on steroids, so to speak. And, uh, and, and you know, as, you, as you saw in this paper, right? So I think it's, it's, uh, when it comes to therapy, it's very reasonable to look at outcomes within a finite period of time in, in, in you know, 30 days. So these trials can be, relatively short. So I do think that we're going to continue to see better evidence that we can trust uh, within within month from now that, you know, contrast that to the challenges we have in uh, trials related to prostate cancer, right, where sometimes you wait for, need to wait for decades to, to look to, to assess the outcome that you really care about. Well, I think those are all the questions that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Dong. That Good. was a great talk. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much for moderating. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And, uh, and have a good day and stay safe. All right.